Hi, I'm JB Zachariah with the Ocean Exploration Trust. And over the years, OET has been bringing out various technology from partners and collaborators to study and sample eDNA or environmental DNA. But what happens to those samples when we bring them back to shore? Recently, we visited with one of our collaborators, Dr. Santiago Herrera at Lehigh University, to see how he and his lab are using those eDNA samples to build a global database of deep sea corals. Welcome to the lab. This is my lab at Lehigh University, and I'm the LPI of the lab. So I'm Santiago Herrera. We studied deep sea ecology and evolution through the lens of environmental DNA, but we also study the genetics of populations and species uh, for different organisms that together give us a better perspective of the biodiversity in our planet, in the deep sea. And the neat thing about eDNA is everything else that we don't uh, use to generate data, we will send to a repository where it will be accessible by anybody. But the DNA sequence data, we're also gonna put it in, in databases and anybody will be able to access it and use it. So there's many possibilities with these samples. So what was it like you yourself sailing on the ship and being in the control van while we explored and sampled these deep sea ecosystems? Um, I love every minute of it. We were conducting cutting edge research with combination of vehicles and technology that have never been used before. Here in the lab, what we do is take filters with the eDNA that we collected and we prepare it for uh, an enrichment step. What that enrichment step means is that we take all the DNA that we get in the filter and then we select for the DNA that we are going to be focusing on. And so if you were looking at the entire diversity of an ecosystem, we will look at what we call markers that allow us to assign barcodes, DNA barcodes. So the problem with those is that they don't let us identify species very well. And so we complement them with some more specific markers that give us more resolution in different groups that we care about. And so we have developed some of those probes and markers that allow us to enrich the DNA for pieces that are coming from, for example, corals. But we can do that with any species, right? What's really unique about eDNA is that we have a representation of the whole community in one sample, and we can target different aspects of it. So why should we be interested in deep sea corals? What do you find so special about them? So about two thirds of all corals live in the deep sea. It's a biodiversity that is poorly understood, yet we know that many coral species play very important roles in the ecosystems that they live. Um, really, when we study the, these ecosystems that are have at the, at the base, corals can use the same samples to both look at the corals, but also look at everything else that is looking living in those communities. We collected physical specimens as well, and we're going to be sequencing those animals to obtain references that we can match the DNA sequences that we obtain from the eDNA and assign identifications. It's very likely that in that process we will realize there will be new things. So we saw how some of the DNA was extracted from the samples and I'd love to see how some of the PCR work is done. Let's take a look. I have uh, one of the most senior graduate students in my lab working on this right now. Okay, uh, not too much of a crazy step here. So I am just transferring uh, the DNA that I just cleaned with ammonium acetate into another tube to then put in with uh, isopropanol. But I'm just gonna be taking a one-to-one -one ratio of my ammonium acetate with the DNA. So I add the isopropanol so that way it precipitates the DNA out from liquid. It basically forms a pellet that I can then spin down in the centrifuge tomorrow. That pellet contains the DNA that we extracted from the filter DNA and then we could clean that out a little bit more with ethanol, and then we we're able to have purified DNA to move on to our next steps, which is sequencing and seeing what we found in our filters. So now that Milan has extracted the DNA, we are going to run um, a polymerase chain reaction. So I will take her DNA extracts, and I'm gonna add a couple of reagents to them, and then we will run it over to a machine to run the PCR. I'm going to take some of her DNA and we put it onto this plate. So now that I have the DNA extracts in the tubes, 
I can add a master mix and this contains different um, reagents and what's most important is that it contains something called TAC polymerase. This will be what enables that reaction to break up the DNA and then replicate it in, during the PCR reaction. And now we'll add um, what's called the primers. These are special little segments of DNA that will attach to the broken up DNA during PCR and will amplify the regions that we're interested in. So these primers in particular were designed to um, amplify different types of corals. All right, so now that we have our extracted DNA with all the different reagents that are essential for performing um, PCR, we're actually going to put it into the machine called a thermocycler. And this machine has a hot plate here and this it will go through different cycles of temperature that help the PCR process go along. And then once this is done, what products will we have? So this will, um, it denatures the DNA and then it, it breaks up and it amplifies that one region that we're looking into, that's our specific barcode we're looking for. And it creates multiple copies of it and then we will sequence those copies. So after we are done with our thermocycler, we are ready to check out our DNA and see how well it was amplified. So what we're gonna do is open this up, remove it from the heat block, and we are ready to transfer it from a plate to some strip tube so we can check it out. So now we're going to move to this machine called the tape station. And we use this in our lab to check out not only the concentration of DNA so we can see how much we have in each tube, which is important to know for processes further down the line. And we can also see the quality. So okay. we can see how well the thermocycler did and our extractions went. And this is kind of the final result of all our hard work before sequencing. So we're gonna open this up. We can run about 16 samples at a time. So we're just gonna load in our strip tubes of sample, ready to go. Just gonna close this up. So then 20 minutes later, after we've run our tape station samples, we are ready to look at how it turned out. So here we have a lot of different information. So we can actually see the concentration in this column. And it's also important to know the different fragment sizes of DNA. So these all correlate to different sizes of DNA fragments. So then when we actually run our samples, we actually can see where they fall within those regions. So now that we have taken a look at the samples and we see that they are good to go, we're happy. We are actually ready to prepare these to get sequenced and send out for sequencing. So after we get DNA sequences, this is the kind of information that we can uh, produce. So what you see here are the presence and uh, relative abundance of different species of corals. And so with, with this kind of uh, enrichment of DNA from the environment samples that we took, we can know what species are there, but also how much of the DNA that we enrich comes from different species. And so it is not a perfect quantitative tool, but allows us to get a much bigger picture and allows us to provide some assignments to species if we have a good reference. So right now we are looking at ways that we can improve the references. One of the big things that we're focused on is building that reference for the Central Pacific. By having a spatial awareness of where our data comes from, we can build a better understanding of how different species are interacting with one another, right? One of the powerful things that we were able to do in the Nautilus was to put uh, a DNA sampler system on the ROV. What we can gain by, by filtering a, a large volume of water is that we can get a much larger sample of DNA. And so we are more confident that the signals that we detect in the DNA is actually representative of the community. Well, the ocean is a huge place and so be able to say, you know, we, we are taking a good sample requires being able to uh, really capture the heterogeneity that exists in the environment. And so we're making strides towards that. This was one of the first tests of the kind of system and we are really excited about applying the same technology in other expeditions.